and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Erica Noble, originally from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm a PhD candidate in the Biological Anthropology Program, studying the sacroiliac joints in humans and non-human primates. I'm pleased to introduce Vilas Borghese Distinguished Achievement Professor John Hoffs, who will be sharing insights into new mysteries of human origin and how enormous advances in our understanding of human evolution have opened new windows into our past. John is a paleoanthropologist specializing in human evolution and genetics across the last six million years. His work has touched almost every part of our evolutionary story from the very origin of our lineage among the apes up to the last 10,000 years of our history. His work has taken him to Africa, Asia, and Europe where he has collaborated with esteemed international colleagues in measuring thousands of bones and investigating dozens of archeological sites. John received his PhD in anthropology from the University of Michigan, has published numerous scholarly articles, essays, and books, and has given lectures at educational institutions around the world. He has received several awards for his teaching, outreach, and research, and has served as an on-screen expert for documentaries and shows on networks such as the Discovery Channel, PBS, the History Channel, and the National Geographic Channel. Please welcome John Hawks. Thank you so much, Erica, for that introduction. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, this is a really exciting time in human origins research. And I mean, we're here in the middle of a global pandemic. And so it is a time that many of us are revisiting and thinking about what the last 10 years of discoveries means for understanding the future of our science. And so as I thought about what to share with all of you, I thought, you know, let's actually look at that last decade of discoveries, give a, a quick overview of what things in, you know, many people's ideas about human evolution may have changed a lot in the last decade, and then look at five things that I think are questions that I don't have answers to. And so I think that those are really important foci of research. So to give a quick overview of where I'm going in this talk, I'm gonna give a quick overview of human origins. The last 6 million years, our connection to other living primates and, and the basic storyline as it may have stood about a decade ago. Then I'm gonna talk about the highlights of the last decade of discoveries. I'm gonna go through some of the big changes that we've seen and how they've impacted the way that we look at the picture of human origins. And then I'm going to talk about those five unsolved questions that I have, and they're not the only questions, but there are five that I think are really central and that we will probably have avenues of information that are going to tell us more about very soon. For those of you who are interested in this field and want to know a really up-to-date view of it, I encourage you to check out my book with my friend Lee Berger, Almost Human. It's a book that covers two of our big discoveries, Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi, but also gives a context of, of where human origins research stands. So for a deeper look at this, I encourage you to check that out. Human evolution has an enormous record of fossil discoveries and today other discoveries, including genetic discoveries that give us a lot of evidence about it. I start every talk with that because you see again and again around, you know, if you're reading about this field, you'll see headlines that say that we have to question everything. A new discovery overturns what we knew. This almost never is true. The fact is that we have today a deep record of human origins with thousands of fossils representing thousands of ancient individuals that give us a very detailed picture of many parts of the human story. Now that fossil record has biases and, and blind spots, right? So that there are, are times that we know an awful lot and there are times that we know relatively little. We know much more about recent populations within the past few hundred thousand years and much less about the earliest parts of our story. We know enormous detail about some populations, the Neanderthals are one of those populations, and we know almost nothing about some others. So I don't wanna overstate and say that we know everything there is to be known. In fact, there are enormous mysteries and great questions that are there in front of us to answer. But 
I also don't want to begin with the impression that we know very little, because in fact, we know a lot. And our details about ancient humans, their biology, our fossil relatives, those details are real. And they, and they give us a really strong scaffold of the overall story. Now, let's start with our connection to our close relatives, the living primates. Humans are phylogenetically, we're part of the tree of great apes. And most of you are probably familiar with the basic great apes, right? We've got chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and I've got them here. Many of you may be less aware that our knowledge of these great apes has, has deepened, and especially with today's genetic information, we now understand that there's a greater diversity of great apes than we appreciated in the past. Chimpanzees have a close relative, the bonobos, and they separated, you're gonna see in a tree in a second, about 2 million years ago. Chimpanzees themselves are composed of subspecies that have enormous differences in diversity across Africa. A few primatologists would like to name them four different species of chimpanzees. So that diversity reaches back hundreds of thousands of years. Gorillas likewise have two big branches, lowland gorillas, gorilla gorilla, and in eastern gorillas, both eastern lowland and eastern highland or mountain gorillas, gorilla beringi, those also have diversity that goes back hundreds of thousands of years. And orangutans are actually today composed of three species, Sumatran orangutans, Bornean orangutans, and a, a small population on Sumatra known as Tapunuli orangutans. So the history of these and their relationship with us goes back millions of years. Chimpanzees and bonobos share a common ancestor about one to two million years ago. Gorillas, Eastern and Western gorillas share an ancestor between about 400,000 and a million years ago. Orangutans, Sumatran and Bornean orangutans about 400,000 to a million years ago. And the Tapanuli orangutans between two and three million years ago branching from them. So we've got a million years, two million years, up to three million years of diversification of all of these primates. Humans, are our, our closest living relatives are the chimps and bonobos. And our branch, the hominin branch, separated from them something like six to nine million years ago. Gorillas are our next closest relatives. And then we share ancestors with the living orangutans between 12 and 14 million years ago. So that's our situation in the tree of relationships of living primates. That means that we have something like six or seven million years of our lineage and its diversification. And we have a rich fossil record of our lineage. Beginning from seven to four million years ago, we have human relatives that we found in central North Africa and in Ethiopia that represent branches that are clearly on the human lineage. These are branches represented by species like Sahelanthropus chadensis, Ardipithecus ramidus. Between four and two and a half million years ago, we have an array of fossils that belong to species that we call Australopithecus. Australopithecus afarensis is a well-known species that includes the Lucy skeleton around, around 3.2 million years old. Uh, Australopithecus africanus is a well-known species in South Africa, where I've done a lot of field work, that is between about three and two and a half to two million years old. These species share with us our upright bipedal form of locomotion. And so if we looked at the first third of our evolutionary history, we have species that are human-like in their teeth in some respects and in some aspects of their lifestyle, but not obligate bipeds, not upright walking on the ground as we are. Between four and two and a half million years ago, about the second third of our evolutionary story, we have creatures that are like us in our upright walking, but very different from us in some respects, especially in, in their brain size. If we look at their skeletons, right? These are all Australopiths. Their skeletons all have this upright form, right? And we've got a lot of skeletal evidence of them, including some really impressive skeletons that show us what they moved like. But if we look at their brains, their brains were very different from ours. Uh, their brains are about a third the size of human brains today. 
So those species represent about the second third of our evolutionary history. Beginning two and a half million years ago, we have some relatives of ours that are close to us, close enough that we call them members of our own genus, Homo. Homo habilis is an example of this starting from about 2.1 million years ago, Homo erectus from about 2 million years ago, first in Southern Africa, then in East Africa. We also have during this time frame a, a set of species that are human-like in their locomotion, but are very different from us in diet. These species that we call Paranthropus or robust Australopithecus. Here we have Australopithecus boisei, Australopithecus robustus. These species have really big teeth, massive jaws, but and so they're very different from us in terms of their diet, but they are similar to us in being upright walking. So we have a diversification of the hominin lineage at the same time that our genus Homo arises. Once Homo arises, one of the great things about, about Homo is that it begins to disperse around the world. So this skeleton from Dimenisi, a site in, in the Republic of Georgia, is one of the earliest to be found outside of Africa. Before this, our homeland, the human lineage, originates in Africa only. And so the diversification around the world is something that we see with our genus arising, the genus Homo. When we look at the skeletons of Homo, I have one here on the far left, the Turkana boy skeleton from Kenya, around 1.5 million years old, compared to Australopithecine skeletons. And you see that he's taller. And this kid is, is about a nine-year-old kid. And you see that he's already taller than most of these Australopiths are. You know, this is something where our lineage, the, the human lineage, Homo, has within it upright walking and long distance walking and running as, as fundamental. What we abandon is some of our ability to climb that earlier hominins had. So we also begin to get slightly larger brain size, but I gotta tell you that the earliest members of Homo are about 600, 500 to 600 cubic centimeter brain sizes. They're not like people today, 1,200, 1,300, 1,500 brain, cubic centimeters. Um, they're less than half of the brain size of people today. And so brain evolution is something that is really important in some branches of our genus within the last 2 million years. Starting around a million years ago, up to 600, 600 500,000 years ago, we have a diversification of larger brained members of our genus. The most famous of these are the Neanderthals. And I wanted to show you this slide. This is my friend Yakov Radovic uh, from the Croatia Natural History Museum at the, at the top left. Um, this is the Kropina collection of Neanderthals. And I just wanted to emphasize, we have some enormous fossil samples of Neanderthals. We know a lot about them. His, this, these fossils from Cima de los Huesos in Spain, around 430,000 years old, again, early Neanderthals. We've got a lot of evidence of these guys. We know a lot about them. And, and that knowledge has translated a lot of it into the public awareness. So we continue to know more and more details about Neanderthals. Their lives are fascinating. A lot of people take away from human origins that what I should know about is Neanderthals. And, the first big discovery that I'm gonna talk about of the last decade, Neanderthal DNA, is one of those that's adding detail to our understanding of these components of human origins. Between about 300,000 and 200,000 years ago, our own species, Homo sapiens, modern humans, emerges in Africa. And so at the same time that we have a diversity of hominins like the Neanderthals in other parts of the world, we have our species arising in Africa. And so that last component of our evolutionary history, if you asked me 10 years ago, you know, what do most people understand about this? It's that there's a branching and our species, Homo sapiens, is an African species, again, returning to an African origin. So if we look at the tree of relationships of these fossil human relatives and ancestors, that tree is a complicated one. It's got many branches, 
And those branches, we don't know exactly the connections between all of them. So I can say generally, our lineage, the Homo lineage within this, this hominin family has a common ancestor, but how it's connected and exactly which species are branching after that is presently unclear. Likewise, within the earliest members of our genus, um, the, the earliest members of our family, the Australopiths, we, we have uncertainty about how they're connected and how they're related. Okay, so that tree now, I wanna focus on how present discoveries are changing that tree. And in the way that the last decade of discoveries has really shifted our understanding. So I've sketched out for you the big picture. Let's look at some recent discoveries and see how those have changed the picture. First, Neanderthal DNA. In 2010, Svante Pabo's lab at the, at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology produced the first draft Neanderthal genome. Neanderthal genetics has progressed enormously since that time over the last decade. And so it's difficult to summarize in a few words what we've learned about Neanderthals and their, and their genetics and their connections to us. A genome contains 3 billion base pairs of information. Right, that's, that's you know, like more. It's like six gigabytes of information on your on your hard drive, right? And and so as those information have diversified, as we've learned more and more about different Neanderthals and the diversity of Neanderthals, we have a store of information that we're still uncovering. And I've been fortunate to be part of some of this work. I got to tell you that it's transforming a lot of things. I wanna summarize a couple of big findings from it. First, we now understand that everybody living today has Neanderthals among their ancestors. Everybody in the world has some genealogical ancestry that comes from Neanderthals. The genetics of that Neanderthal ancestry is present in some populations more than others. Populations that have historic ancestry outside of Africa, from Europe, from East Asia, Southeast Asia, Oceania, the Americas, and, and North Africa have around 2% Neanderthal genetic ancestry. Further south in Africa, below the Sahara, there's a little less than that, right? It's, it's something like two thirds of 1%, but everybody has some Neanderthal and it's expressed in some populations more than others. For the most part, we don't know what this small fraction of Neanderthal ancestry what it does for us, how it matters. We know that it's expressed in everybody that existed outside of Africa after the modern humans dispersed there. And so, and so we know that the mixing happened relatively early in the migration of people into Eurasia. We know that the descendants of those first migrants carry the Neanderthal sort of signature, signature. of mixture. And yeah, we know yeah, that, that the, and we know that the, Excuse me, I'm just gonna take a drink. And we know that the very first Europeans have a little bit more Neanderthal than other people. So mixing is part of the heritage of everybody. In terms of what these genes do for anybody, we know that immunity is important and that innate immunity is something that many present day people have functional genes that have come from Neanderthals. We know that there are genes related to skin and hair and, and pigmentation that some people have got today that, that are functional that come from Neanderthals. We know that there are genes related to lipid metabolism that some that people have today that are important in, in some regions. We know that there are a few genes that are disproportionately common that people have today from Neanderthals, but for the most part, Neanderthal ancestry is rare. For the most part, we think that it maybe probably doesn't do anything noticeable. So it's a sign of ancestry that doesn't have a distinct sort of way of, of causing humans to be biologically different. A second big discovery that's related to the Neanderthal genome is the discovery of the Denisovans. The Denisovans we understand today are a population that existed somewhere east 
of the Neanderthals. So the Neanderthals have a geographic range that goes from Spain in the far west to Central Asia and the Altai Mountains in the east. The Denisovans have a geographic range that includes the Altai Mountains because Denisova Cave is in the Altai, but the mixture that Denisovan ancestry shows with today's people finds that, that actually the maximum amount of Denisovan DNA is found in Oceanian populations today, including the, the Aboriginal population of Australia and New Guinea, in Polynesian people, Melanesian people, and in some of the indigenous peoples of the Philippines and Indonesia. So that's the maximum. We know that this must have been a widespread population. If we look at what we understand about the connections of today's human populations, and a schematic puts today's people here on the left side, Neanderthals as sort of a pinkish line going down the middle, and three Neanderthal genomes there are, are represented. And the Denisovan genome from Denisova Cave uh, at the a little bit right there, the schematic of their evolutionary history is that Denisovans and Neanderthals come from a common ancestry, something like uh, five to 600,000 years ago. Their ancestors diverged from the African ancestors of today's people, something like seven to 800,000 years ago. And all of these groups mixed with the ancestors of more recent populations of humans, so that this mixture is something that's a big part of our evolutionary history. Denisovan DNA, like the Neanderthal DNA, most of it probably is not noticeably functional, but there are some really big stories. And one of them is that to present day peoples in the Himalaya mountains have a Denisovan origin gene that helps them to, to metabolize oxygen at high altitude. So there's a, a functional connection that some people have that we can really trace to this Denisovan ancestry. One of the other things about Denisova Cave as a place where DNA is exceptionally well preserved is that one fragment of bone from this cave has DNA from an individual that had a Neanderthal parent and a Denisovan parent. A Neanderthal mother, it's Mother's Day, so we have a Neanderthal mother, a Denisovan father in this case. And so we know that these populations were mixing enough that we find individuals that express the direct mixture, right? With the Neanderthal DNA, we have individuals that are modern human individuals from Europe that have a Neanderthal great-great-grandparent. So we know that this mixing is happening and we're catching people who are recent participants in the mixing. So mixing is something that's really important to our ancestry. If we look at a modern human population tree, we see that this mixing is part of the ancestry of all of today's people to one extent or another. And one of those includes African unknown populations that are mixing into today's African populations and making up part of their ancestry. All right, other new discoveries. Now, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, Homo floresiensis from the island of Flores in Indonesia is a major discovery. This is a skeleton and, and a group of skeletal remains from a cave called Liangboa Cave that existed up to about 65,000 years ago and represent, as you can see here, individuals that are skeletally very different from today's people in a lot of ways. They're really small in stature. The, the one skull that, that has a brain that we can measure has a very small brain size. And so here's a population that was totally unexpected. It occurred recently on these islands. And we now know from the last few years of research that this population was not alone. Flores Island, and you'll see Flores in the lower center of my map here, which has Liang Bua and the earlier Matamenge site that has a, a partial jaw, which is probably the same population, is joined by a uh, population of hominins on the island of Luzon, the northernmost island of the Philippines, which is at the top of the map here, which is represented at a site called Kalao Cave. Again, a site within the last 100,000 years that has evidence of hominins that are very small and thereby very different from today's people and from their plausible ancestors in other parts of the world. So the islands that I'm just gonna back up a slide here. I wanna emphasize 
Here I've got the lowest sea level from the Pleistocene. When the glaciers had spread across the northern continent, sea level was lower. It was possible to walk out to islands like Java and Borneo that are presently islands that were once part of continental Asia. But these other islands like Flores and Luzon were always islands. And hominins were crossing these water crossings, reaching these places. And those hominins that existed on these islands that we found so far are very small. And in the case of Flores, have a very small brain size. So these are hominins that are quite different from us. It's unclear to us today whether these human relatives were distant relatives that may have shared ancestors with us more than 2 million years ago, or were closer relatives that may have reached these islands within the last million years and have then changed a lot. We don't know yet, right? Because we have to find a better record of their ancestors to know that. But what we do know is that this diversification, this branching was fundamental to, to populations in this region. So that brings up African discoveries that represent previously unknown populations. One of those is Australopithecus sediba, found by my friend Lee Berger and his son Matthew, actually, in two, first in 2008. Australopithecus sediba is a species that existed around 2 million years ago, has some more human-like elements than the earlier members of Australopithecus, but especially emphasizes a skeleton that has a mosaic, as we call it, a mixture of features of ancestral hominins, very ancient hominins, and more recent hominins. Sediba is establishing a picture that, that I want to reinforce, because when we look at other recent discoveries, and I'll show the little foot skeleton here, uh, which is just at the left of the, of the graphic. The little foot skeleton is a skeleton that was first found in 1996, but has only recently been brought out of the rock that it was encased in and, and made apparent to the scientific community. This skeleton also, it's about two and a half million years old, has a mixture of characteristics. The Homo naledi skeletons, and I'll talk about that in the next slide, have a mixture of characteristics. One of the big discoveries from these skeletons that are adding evidence of hominin species from across their whole body is that the features are not lining up with a tree that's easy for us to understand. The features are lining up in ways that, that seem to conform to possibly different trees. So when I showed you first the tree and I said, we don't know how these things go together. One of the big reasons for that is that different parts of the skeleton are telling us different things about how they go together. So Homo naledi, a big discovery that I was fortunate to be involved in several years ago from the rising star cave system of South Africa is another of these major discoveries. Homo naledi, around 200 to 300,000 years old, existed in Southern Africa at the same time that our direct ancestors, the early members of our species, Homo sapiens, were evolving. But this species is highly different from us. It has human-like characteristics, as in its hand. It has very human-like characteristics of its hand. We think that those are probably related to stone tool manufacture. But its brain, ranging from about 450 to around 550 milliliters or cubic centimeters, about a third the size of ours, about equal to the size of some of the earliest hominins in terms of their brain size. So here's a species that, again, has this really strange mixture of characteristics. It's something that is a recent discovery. And I got to tell you, I've got it here at the top of the graph. And because there it is in time, something like 250,000 years old. But we don't know how it connects to our family tree. We don't know if Homo naledi has been around for 2 million years before we found it and has evolved in parallel with our species and others, or whether it's a recent divergence from our species and has evolved in a different direction in a big way. And this is really a big mystery about human origins today, is what is the pattern of evolution? Are the same things emerging again and again? And if so, are they the things that are more like the earliest hominins emerging again and again because it's a throwback again and again? Or are they things like modern humans 
emerging again and again because things are evolving in similar ways again and again. The earliest stone tools. 10 years ago, I would have told you the earliest stone tools are something like 2.6 million years old and coincident with the first members of our genus. Today, I can tell you the earliest stone tools are 3.3 million years old, and we don't have anything like Homo that's that early. So we know that early stone tools are being made by hominins that are part of the earliest sort of divergence of hominins, the, the earliest upright walking species. That's not maybe surprising because chimpanzees are great tool users. Some orangutans, especially Sumatran orangutans are great tool users. There's no reason to think that all hominins were not, were not great tool users. We've looked at stone tools as being special, but actually stone tools are part of a broad repertoire of technology. And if there's one thing that's, that's true about technology, it's that species pick it up and invent things again and again. And so probably that's what we're looking at with humans. I want to say a couple of words about some of the earliest hominins, the earliest part of our story. Ardipithecus ramidus, whose skeleton was first made available to the scientific community in 2009, is a species that has a curious mixture of features that have some things that are very much chimpanzee or gorilla-like. Uh, you can see there the feet of this skeleton and how they're, they're placed there with diverging toes. That's not just random. Their feet are grasping feet. Their hands, you can see the fingers on those hands, are chimpanzee or gorilla-like hands with very long fingers, very strong tendons. Um, but a pelvis that has some aspects that indicate a more upright posture. So that's why we think it's a relative of ours. It's, it's sort of changes in the pelvis, the base of the skull and the teeth, but it's not very much like us. And the first third of our evolutionary history was made up of species that may have been like this not very human-like. So let me transition to these big questions that I have. I've sort of summarized some of the, some of the, the, the new discoveries and how they've shifted the way we think about things. Let me leave you with five questions that I have that I think are big questions and that, that show you sort of the depth of what we don't know today about human origins. The first of those we've discovered in the last decade Australopithecus sediba, Homo naledi, Homo floresiensis, Homo luzonensis, the Denisovans. Some of these are species that existed within the past 300,000 years, right? This is the time that our species originates, that we know what's around. Modern humans are there. I would have, or almost anybody in our field would have told you 10 years ago that when modern humans show up, we're trouble. Right, We disperse around the world. We're a tremendously successful species. We wipe out all of our competition. But actually now it's clear this didn't happen. Modern humans were themselves diverse. There were branches of our close relatives within Africa that were mixing with us until recently. Modern humans, when they dispersed, mixed with other populations. And there are very different species like Homo naledi, Homo floresiensis, that are hugely different from us that are still existing with modern humans, including within Africa. When we look at the tree of what we know about, and this is a tree that's drawn from genetics, right? This tree shows us that there are lineages both outside of Africa, the Neanderthals, the Denisovans, I'm just, I haven't made three lineages of Denisovans there as an accident at the bottom of the graph, right? Those three lineages of Denisovans really are diverse lineages. We've got evidence of separate mixtures with the ancestors of, of today's humans in different parts of Asia, Southeast Asia. And those different mixtures represent populations that are more different from each other, the Denisovans, than anybody living today is. So, there's three kinds of Denisovans. There's a couple of kinds of Neanderthals that are more different from each other than any two populations that we know about today in terms of genetic distance. There are super archaic populations that we only know about because they mixed with the ancestors of Denisovans or Neanderthals. Now this is taking a little bit of calculus, I would say, to our, to our genetic data to say, wait a minute, this genetic data shows us a population that we know about from, from an actual genome, but that actual genome, if we put it on a tree, doesn't fit very well. 
And the way to make it fit better is to, is to understand that, wait, there's something else here that's not represented in the tree. And that's how we make these inferences about these super archaic, these ancient populations. We know that there were multiple ones of them that contributed to the ancestry of these groups. And by the same methodology, we know that today's African populations have branches that go back very far that are not represented in today's people. So these branches of our ancestry that we know about from genetics, they're there. Some geneticists call them ghost populations because we know that they're there because they leave footprints that we can see. But otherwise, we haven't yet placed them in the fossil record. It's a big question. How many of them were there? And I got to tell you the truth. We don't know. If you ask me how many do I think there were, I think that there were at least a dozen of them and that we have only begun to find them. How did those populations, if they're mixing all the time, how did they retain their diversity? This is a big question, right? I'll take you back to the Denisova cave where we have evidence from one cave system of two ancient populations, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans that are separated by more than 300 to 400,000 years of evolution and yet hybridized in a way that we find the hybrid. If we're finding the hybrids in our fossil record, which good as it is, still represents only a handful of individuals, they can't be rare. Hybridization must have been quite common. If hybridization was common, why didn't these populations blend together? We don't know the answer to this. It may be that it's fundamental in the geographic ranges of these populations, that there were areas like Central Asia, perhaps, where they were flowing in and didn't flow out, that is a population sink. That's a possibility. It may be that they were adapting in some parts of their range faster, and so we're continually replacing other parts from these central places. It may be that these differences reflect geographic refugia that were important when glaciation spread and, and limited populations. But whatever is true in this part of the world, it also must have been true in Africa for species like Homo naledi to have persisted for as long as it did alongside our own species. It suggests that there's some important component of our evolution that is creating and encouraging these kinds of diversity without allowing the populations to blend together. We keep finding now populations late in our evolutionary history that have small brains. Now, 10 years ago, none of us really thought that this was going to be possible. And this raises a question of what is the real importance of brain size, right? Here's Homo floresiensis on the far left compared to a late Homo erectus or maybe Denisovan individual from Java. Those two lived at the same time. They're really different in brain size. Two African larger brain hominins here on the right side, uh, one from Omo, an early modern human, one from Cowboy, uh, an archaic human, compared with two Naledi skulls on the bottom right. These all existed together. All of these existed at the same time. They're all competent. They're all able to survive for a long time in, in if not geographic synchrony, at least geographic contact with each other. What is going on? 10 years ago, anybody would have said that human evolution is a story of gradually increasing brain size. And, and that pattern is super obvious, right? Until you get these recent discoveries, which have tiny brains. And in fact, our present day understanding of this is that actually there's a diversity of branches that have different trajectories of brain size that look like technological creatures. How did this happen? We don't know. And it raises a question of what is this brain size about? If stone tools emerge much earlier than any increases in brain size, if these late, large, uh, small brain species are found with stone tools, right, what's going on with this? The answer is we don't know. Early discoveries such as Ardipithecus, right? which have this mosaic of anatomy. That mosaic comes from a diversity of locomotor behavior. They're climbing, they're walking upright on the ground sometimes. 
there are different lineages of them. Those lineages hang on for some time. What was that diversity like? And how did it enable our own lineage committed to upright walking and running? How did it enable that lineage to, to persist and diversify? We don't know the answer to this. We really, when we look at skeletons and they're not just like humans, we say, well, they're climbing. But we don't know exactly what that means in the repertoire of these creatures. After all, today's humans climb. My kids climb in the playground. And so there's a diversity of behavior today. There's a diversity of behavior among living primates. And we don't know how adaptation functioned in these early members of our lineage to enable the diversity of their locomotor systems and why one of them ultimately won out over the others. So it's a big unsolved question and one that implies that, that, that impinges upon our understanding of the functional biology of the skeleton and the way that it mattered to natural selection. There's a little foot skeleton, which is a great example of this, right? And the Artipithecus skeleton. Okay, so the last question I wanna leave you with, what are the other apes? Now, when I began and I placed our story into the context of the story of diversity among the great apes, I emphasized that there are these branches of apes that go back and have greater diversity than we appreciated maybe 10 years ago. The genomes of these apes have told us a lot about their ancestry. We know that we have a fossil record of some of these lineages. The Sumatran apes or the Bornean, the Sumatran orangutans or Bornean orangutans, they are not represented today by a fossil record, but Javan orangutans going back into the Pleistocene are. Chinese orangutans and, and orangutans in Vietnam are. So we know that there are members of the orangutan genus that were much more widespread. We have a record of them. We don't know where they will fit amid today's diversity of them, but we also have ancient members of this, I, I wanna go back to this, ancient members of the same lineage, I'll pop to in just a minute. Chimpanzees, we have very little fossil record of. We have one possible fossil chimpanzee from the middle Pleistocene of the Turkana Basin in Kenya, and it's just a couple of teeth, right? There's not much of it. And otherwise, we know very little about their fossil record. Gorillas, we have a fossil gorilla relative that's around seven to nine million years old from Ethiopia, Cororopithecus. So it existed at a time when we know that gorillas were originating and it was a large toothed primate at least, but this is sort of the limit of the record. Our origins are abundantly well-documented by fossils compared to the origins of these other living primates. But what we understand about their population structure today is that these other living primates have population structures with long histories, hundreds of thousands of years of populations that are similar to what we see in the genetics of archaic humans. And so what that implies is that they represent a model for what our Pleistocene evolution may have looked like, but that means that what their Pliocene record of evolution, a Miocene record of evolution, going back 10 million years might have looked like is very different. A hint of that comes from a primate called Gigantopithecus. Gigantopithecus is, as you might imagine, gigantic. It has teeth that are like this big, right? And if you just calculate it on tooth size, how big is this primate? We think that it must have been something like 400 pounds. Now that may be misleading, right? Because maybe the teeth are just big and the primate's not as big. But the cool thing about Gigantopithecus, which existed in China, in Vietnam, in India, going back as far as the late Miocene, is that Gigantopithecus we know is an orangutan relative. And recently scientists led by Frito Welker obtained proteomes from its teeth and show that it is, as we expected, an orangutan relative whose ancestry goes back something like 10 million years. We have these fossils of the orangutan lineage and we will fit them together. We need to find more of them. The tree of these other apes must be as diverse and interesting as our own. And understanding that tree and, and each of the trees is gonna tell us much more about how we evolved because what we see in the hominins is that the same things are happening again and again. 
they must have been happening in the great apes as well. So that's where I want to end today. And I've raised some, some big topics. They're not definitive. There's probably a hundred mysteries that, that I'm curious about, that I talk about in my courses, and some of which we're working on. But as you leave this, I just want to encourage you, think through what you didn't know before. Because the fact is that today, we have opened new horizons in understanding human origins. Those horizons go beyond the hominins and, and demand us to ask questions about our relatives that matter to our own evolution. But they also, within the hominins, require us to look at things in new ways. We really understand things differently today than we did 10 years ago. And it's not because we've overturned everything. It's because we appreciate a set of nuances that were never obvious to us before. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for listening and I encourage you to ask some questions in the chat. I'm gonna be taking questions for a while and I'll turn it over to Fran who maybe has some questions for me already. Great, John, thanks so much. Hello everybody, Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. Uh, man, such, such an interesting career that we're sort of all envious of. I think um, when I look at the research and the places you've traveled and the things you've uncovered, you know, it's the sort of the Indiana Jones uh, <laughs> career. That's very cool. So thanks for sharing that with us. Some great um, comments in the chat here. So Ronald Lippy says, John, it's been five years since I retired and stopped teaching human evolution. Your very nice talk has been an excellent quick update. Thank you. Mary Cruel says, very interesting. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. We also had a question from Jeff Scott, and this was early on in your talk. So you did a, later address a lot about the Den Denisovans, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, but he asked, why do we have such a rich fossil record of Neanderthals and not others? And I can concur with that when you go to museums, it's usually the Neanderthals that are so well represented. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I wanna say a couple of words about this because there is a perception, right? Because when I learned anthropology, there's this perception that, well, you know, it's just luck that we have, you know, some parts of the world represent, are represented well in the fossil record because of a chance of geology of all this stuff. There's, a, there's an element of that. But in reality, what I think is vastly more important is our biases as a field historically in investigating places and in, inv in investing in the development of our science in places, right? Why do we know a lot about Europe? Because European archeologists have been digging things for a long time. And not only, right, because of, of the investment of interest in Europe, but also because the investment of interest was early at a time when archeologists went into sites with pickaxes and shovels and denuded the entire site, right? Why do we have a lot of Neanderthal skeletons? Because they stripped them out of caves in Southern France 100 years ago. And, and we have the skeletons, but what we lack in many cases is the contextual evidence that's now destroyed that we will never have. So, so the investment of activity, the early investment of activity, I can tell you, right, being involved in a discovery in the cradle of humankind area of South Africa, where we have dozens of cave sites, some of which have been known to produce fossil hominins for now for, for almost 87 years. Those sites have been heavily explored and we're still finding new things that weren't found before, right? So even within a place that's intensively investigated, there's more to find. But I can tell you that the level of investment in field exploration in most of the world has been historically almost zero. And, and it is chance in the sense that somebody went into a cave and noticed something. But what hasn't happened is a, a large scale systematic survey of caves around the world and some sedimentary deposits around the world. And so I can tell you that it's our field's fault that we haven't broadened the record in a lot of places. Now we're gonna do better as we increasingly connect the fossils we have with the genetic information. We'll know before long some fossils that are Denisovans, right? So, so we're gonna know more, but we must do much more with field exploration. That is for me, the highest priority and something I'm dedicating a lot of my attention to today. 
So are there any continents that have just completely not been explored at this point? You know, I would say that everywhere there's there's things that we've found and things that we've noticed, but but everywhere there's still new stuff to find, right? And even in Europe, which is intensively sort of explored now for 150 years, there are still caves that are that are being noticed for the first time, openings to caves that are being found, open air sites that are, you know, targets of road construction. And so, oh my goodness, we found something amazing. This happens in the United States. It happens all over the world. What we desperately need to do is to invest in the heritage infrastructure and careers of people involved in heritage so that we can responsibly steward those discoveries and, and bring them to the scientific community in a, in a better way. Appreciate that, John. Lucian St. Martin asks, could there be a possibility of overlooking smaller primates in interest of larger hominid species? It's almost certainly true. And a question that we always ask ourselves about the early hominin record is, are we finding actually something that maybe isn't a hominin and represents, if not one of the living branches of great apes, an extinct branch? And for some, I have that question in front of me, right? Every time we find a new fossil in the cradle of humankind, I look at it and I say, am I sure this is a human relative and not something else? And we take that very seriously today. There is historically a bias toward publication and drawing attention to human relatives versus other things. I want to do as much as I can to redress that bias because right now today, it is bigger headline news for me in our field to have a fossil chimpanzee than to have another fossil hominin. I mean, fossil hominins are great. I, you know, I've been fortunate to find some, but it is, in fact, much more scientifically important to add information in the, in the lineages we don't already have. And finding something new and unexpected is better yet than anything. So I think it's true that historically there has been a bias against investigation of places where primate remains are likely to be found relative to hominins, and also in terms of identifying fragmentary things as hominins. But I also think that right now, the scientific attention is so strongly on finding representatives of these lineages that if there's something that in a museum that's uncertain, we would have turned it up by now. So the fact is that what we need is field exploration to find these. Thank you. Lily Houtman says, hello, Professor Hawks. Have there been any updates on Homo luzonensis? since its discovery about two years ago? Yeah, so Luzonensis was first published about two years ago, and it's a major discovery, right? And I got to tell you that, that a series of finds on Luzon, including uh, evidence of stone tools and cut marks more than 700,000 years old, have really established that hominins were in the Philippines early. There is not an update, right? We don't have new published information about this. And I'm waiting eagerly, right? Because you know, obviously finding things, skeletal remains in the field is a rare event and we can't count on it. And, and so waiting for these things is sort of like waiting for the pot to boil, right? It might never boil. Um, but we do have a lot of clever ways of pushing research on things. And I expect that we will see some additional research on the Luzonensis material that will tell us some things that we today maybe don't know. Um, and I'm waiting for that. Uh, but I got to tell you, with remains like this, that are in, that there's only so far a couple of individuals represented, they're, you know, we're very hesitant to, to sample destructively things, to find out proteomic information or things like that. So we take every decision about the next step in, in technology very seriously, where I work in, in South Africa. And I'm, I know that that's equally true in the Philippines, equally true in Indonesia, right? Everywhere that, we, that scientists work with fossil hominins, we think about how to advance the science. We also think about how to responsibly steward the science for the future. Talk a little bit about collaboration. Uh, I noted in the biographical material that you sent, you talked a lot about research sort of being left open for others to expand on and collaboration that way. And I also saw another of your talks where you gave examples of 
very small people fitting in cracks and crags to get down to locate. So can you talk about the discovery team as well as like collaboration through research? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the work that we do in the Rising Star Cave system is a great example of collaboration. Um, you know, I work, at, obviously, I'm based at the University of Wisconsin, but I'm also a, a, a real staff member at the University of Witwatersrand, where I'm in the Center for the Exploration of the Deep Human Journey, uh, with my friend and collaborator, Lee Berger, who's the head of that center. Um, we work with more than 150 collaborators around the world on aspects of the Homo Naledi research and, and on other research. And, and those collaborators are central to what we do, right? We, for any discovery in paleoanthropology, human evolution, we are collaborating with geologists, with, and with a whole spectrum of geo, geologists, geochronologists, structural geologists, uh, folks who are interested in the micromorphology of sediments, folks who are interested in the sedimentology, so the actual particles of tiny minerals in the sediment. We have people who study that. Um, we have the team that is in the Rising Star System, a very specialized skill team going into some of the deep cave chambers that are inaccessible to me and, and larger framed people, right? So the Dinaletti chamber where we work is a chamber in the cave system that has a, a narrow entrance that is a vertical climb that has a minimum width of seven and a half inches or 18 centimeters. It's something that it takes a very specialized skill set, and we have amazing people in the field uh, who who are you know working in the cave system and are you know able to do this. And so that that collaboration is essential. Um, we have collaborators who work on every aspect of the anatomy of the fossils. We have collaborators who work on understanding the trace evidence from the surfaces of the fossils. We have folks who, who can tell the tiny marks that a snail makes with its little teeth compared to insect marks, right? Every bit of this research involves people who have unique skill sets and who work together. And this is true throughout everything in paleoanthropology today. Right. If there's one thing that I want to, you know, leave people with, it's it's to debunk the idea that this is like Indiana Jones, right? <laughs> if you imagine Indiana Jones sitting in a conference room with a couple of dozen other people talking about the tiny marks the snail makes, you know, <laughs> then you're you're more along the lines of what we do, you know, because we're thinking through how do we collect the evidence that really tells us about the maximum information that we can get about the context of these hominins. With Homo naledi, it's a special situation where we know that the hominins were using the deep parts of the cave system and we're trying to work out, did they bury bodies there? Were there some kinds of cultural practices that we can uncover with contextual evidence from this site? Right? And those are things that are hard for us to grapple with scientifically. And so to do it, we rely upon collecting high resolution data making that data available to our own team of collaborators. And once we are publishing, making it available to the broader scientific community and the public so that every step along the way is documented. And that I think is fundamental today to understanding and to working with heritage. The fact is that I look at the past at archeologists from 150 years ago that went into caves and were excited about what they found and dug through them and unearthed them and put the skeletons in museums. And they did, you know, they did me a favor in a sense, in the sense that they recognized the importance of something, they they conserved some of it, but they destroyed much of it. And we deal with the legacy of that destruction, knowing that archaeological work is always a trade-off of how much information you can gather from things versus the inevitable disruption or destruction of the site that you're working. And we do this to advance the science and to conserve as much as we can. And so that trade-off of advancing the science, broadening the understanding of heritage, being responsible stewards of heritage, digging what's necessary to, to advance our knowledge and leaving as much as possible, right? That trade-off is one that involves an entire community of people who talk, interact, 
interact with government authorities in every nation where we work. And, and that's something the public should understand that it's not just making a discovery and putting it in a museum. It is actually an entire set of conversations at levels beyond the scientific level, but including deep conversations at the scientific level about what we do, why we're doing it, and, and how we make responsible decisions at every step to advance the science. So that's something that, that the public should engage in. And your interest in this and watching things like this is the first step in that. But oh. as you get interested in it, you should reach out and engage. Yeah, I was going to say, while we understand uh, that, you know, the, the comparison to the Indiana Jones lifestyle is not realistic, uh, and maybe the job isn't quite that sexy, we uh, uh, do have an enviable, uh, you, you are in an enviable position in, with regard to the interesting discoveries you're making and these fantastic collaborations. So thank you so much for sharing. And I know we're running out of time, but I had one other question that we do ask a lot of experts. Can you just share, especially for the teachers and students listening, how you got involved in anthropology? Sure. When I was a kid, I loved reading about anthropology and I read National Geographic, you know, I read the stories of the discoveries, a huge era of discoveries in the 1980s that were really transforming things. But I never saw that as a career. You know, I grew up in a small town in Kansas and I gotta tell you that I, I didn't have scientists around, right? It wasn't a, a situation where, where I saw, right, how you get into this. I went to university and, and I had the opportunity to become a teaching assistant for a course in anthropology. And that really showed me what it was like to teach and to be engaged in working with skeletal material. And that made me seek it out as a graduate, uh, as, for graduate school as a career. And what has been fundamentally important to me, I wanna say for teachers out there, there's a couple of things that I think are important that maybe a lot of people don't understand, right? The, the interest in science is a big part of what, of what motivates people, right? I'm interested in answering questions. I'm interested in understanding the places that I stand that are special places in many cases. But the skill sets that I use, right? The skill set of collaborating effectively, working well with other people, listening to understand what they tell me, and, and making you know, good decisions based on what I'm hearing from, from a group of people. Drawing, right? Using art and presentation skills in what I do. Photography. Um, you know, I often go back to the very practical things that I learned as a teenager in my small town in Kansas that I use every day. Um, and I think a lot of people don't realize how much of science is practical skills and is not. Right. I use calculus once in a while, right? I don't want to, to mislead anybody, but it's not like I have to pull it out every day. Um, I use a lot of computer programming. I use a lot of, um, a lot of writing skills, right? And, and that stuff, I think, gets underemphasized in high school and in, in primary school in terms of what you encourage people to be interested in science. Working with people right. is a big part of this. Thank you, John Hawks. Really appreciate your sharing your insights with us and shedding a little light on the new mysteries of human origins. Thank you so much. Thank you. Everybody, please tune in uh, Tuesday, May 25th. So we're skipping next week. We will not have a talk next week, but we'll be back May 25th at noon. And we're going to be talking with Leslie Belay, who's the former Wisconsin Historical Society Curator of Costume and Textiles. And she has a fantastic talk about Victorian secrets and the revealing history of women's undergarments. You won't wanna miss it. Please visit badgertalks.wis.edu where you can see our upcoming schedule of talks, sign up for our email list, consider a donation to Badger Talks. We are supported by a grant, so we appreciate your consideration of donations. Or you can also host your own speaker. We have a slate of about 400 speakers that are ready and willing to give talks around the state of Wisconsin. You can fill out the form to request those there. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody.